Welcome everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Again, welcome everyone to this event, Taking Power to Create the Future, Our Bodies, Our Lives, Our Planet. This is a continuing conversation with and for revolutionaries. This event is sponsored by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. My name is Kimberly. Revolutionary pronouns is she and her, and I'm a member of the League. And I'm honored to be with you as your co-moderator for today. Who are the League of Revolutionaries? We are an organization of revolutionaries from different backgrounds and experiences. Working people dedicated to the important work of meeting and joining with other revolutionaries, engaged in fighting for the basic needs of the class and obtaining class power needed to transform this system. What do we do? Our form of direct action is analysis and education. We are dedicated to studying and learning with and helping to elevate the consciousness of other revolutionaries in the workplace in the classroom, in various organizations, in the street, in all areas of struggle. We work to politicize raising the issues of private property and the need for class power. This event is one example of the work that we do. What is our role as revolutionaries? Our role is to connect with the thinking of people and to help bring clarity and develop consciousness. Through their motion and inquiry, we help lead revolutionaries from the perception of the problem to understanding the cause and the solution. The voice of the league is our paper, The Rally, which is accessible from our website, leagueofrevolutionaries.org. We encourage you to visit our website, read the rally, share, and subscribe. Today we're engaging in a continuing conversation with and for revolutionaries. This is a safe space. We wanna hear everyone's voice. We wanna hear everyone's voice, hear and learn from one another. We want to be mindful, to step back, if you have a lot to say, and for others that are a bit quiet to step up, please be curious, open, and respectful. We open this conversation today acknowledging that we inhabit stolen indigenous land. I'm speaking to you from the East Bay in Northern California, land of the Ohlone. As a reminder, again, this event will be recorded and the please make any changes to your screen name or image as necessary. Please use the electronic raise hand function in Zoom, in the Zoom reactions button to be placed on stack to speak. And please use the chat function for comments and questions. Our agenda today will be 90 minutes total, but if it gets good to us, we may go longer as needed. We'll have two questions one for each half of our discussion, and there will be three minutes per speaker. And we will give gentle alerts when it's time to wrap up your thoughts. There will be an evaluation after the event for your feedback, and that link to the evaluation will be placed in chat. I would like to acknowledge our fabulous tech team who has been working hard behind the scenes to ensure that we have a good experience. Michelle, Samantha, Rand, Peter, Joyce, and Allen. They will be monitoring the weight room, chat, stack, and timekeeping. I thank my thanks to you all. So again, we're recording now. And with that, I'll pass the mic to my esteemed co-moderator and friend, Anthony, the savvy professor. You take it away. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Kim. 
Um, so uh, some of you may know, but my name is Anthony Jackson. I am an assistant professor of sociology in the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Human Services at Bowie State University, um, as well as the sociology program coordinator there. Um, and then I also just took on a new role as a director of the prison education program where uh, we go into um, in incarceral facilities and we offer um, uh, incarcerated citizens the opportunity to earn a, a bachelor's degree of sociology uh, while incarcerated. And uh, that's really important because it's a part of uh, what I do in the academy. Um, and this being in the league is part of you know, our active engagement on the streets. And that's something that we actively seek to um, engage with how can we take um, who we are and what we do right in our work and really like build that out in the communities as well towards um, true uh, liberatory change. We're the Deeper Dive Collective. We are a part of the League uh, of Revolutionaries for a New America. Uh, we really developed this collective to really explore social, political, and economic conditions around us. We really are seeking freedom from a system that continues to enslave us as long as we submit our collective power to it. And our goal is really to facilitate a safe space where self-reflection meets action, uh, where this intentionality of consciousness really develops and actualizes into a method. And our objective is take a deeper dive into this moment in history and to help stimulate the working class liberatory consciousness towards ending our collective condition of alienation, exploitation, and oppression. And so as we were thinking about all of these uh, social realities that we're going through right now, um, we were trying to figure out um, really like how can we study this moment in history right now towards uh, moving this collective consciousness towards liberation. Um, so uh, taking power to create our future is definitely uh, a question that we have been grappling with. Um, and as you'll see, it's what revolutionaries before us have been grappling with it as well. Uh, we have come together as comrades, as brothers and sisters in the struggle for liberation to carry the flame of faith and the torch of truth that has been passed down to us from our revolutionary forefathers and mothers. As woke revolutionary intellectual Frantz Fanon writes, and I quote, each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. So the question becomes, uh, what is our mission? Well, what are the current conditions, economic, social, and political, and, and the terrain that we must journey through to discover this mission for, and fulfill it? Well, you know, first we jump into capitalism. Capitalism is killing us, and the urgent moment for a mass revolutionary awakening is upon us. We are in a qualitatively new moment in our human existence. The epoch of capitalism in the 21st century has rapidly transformed our material realities towards abundance though it has convinced the masses of workers the world over today of scarcity. We live in a world where the need for human labor is in decline as the quality of technology has shifted from mechanics to automation, digitization, and robotics. Why is this important? Because advanced technology in manufacturing, production, and telecommunic telecommunications has ushered in a new wave of possibilities for a future where the necessities of life are plentiful and available to those in needs. However, the system of private property under capitalist regime denies us access to actualizing this new world by using its control over economic, social, and political apparatuses to ensure that the masses of working class people will remain in positions of subjugation to the wealthy few whose very power is based upon the exploitation of labor power. We have an abundance of resources though a scarcity of money. And since money is the means by which we are able to subsist, to live within capitalism, the rich and wealthy continue to thrive as workers not only struggle to survive, but are dying while trying to live in a system that creates the conditions of our own destitution. So there are major pieces that I wanna uplift, talking about the crisis, talking about this polarization that exists, talking about fascism, what we're confronting, and then our social realities that we live in and our, our fundamental mission. Today, capitalism is an irreversible crisis that is deadly and destructive in nature and based in the technological evolution, the crisis of capitalist expansion, where capitalism's room for growth has reached its global limits. The crisis of labor, 
where workers' relationship to capital's productive process is shifting as we are becoming increasingly superfluous and the crisis of overproduction, which includes accumulation, distribution, and value and profit. Polarizations are deepening within the ruling class when strategies and tactics to save the system and in capitalism's drive to expand corporate interests, polarizations with th deepen with between capitalism and the working class as they struggle against exploitation, racial and gender oppression, dispossession, and even climate catastrophe. This crisis ridden system is at the precipice of collapse and the capitalist entities that seek to stabilize it are increasingly using force and coercion to avert this impending disastrous outcome, the destruction of the capitalist system. The intensifying motion towards fascism is not only to protect and preserve the system of private property, but also a method of controlling capitalist crisis and the economic, political, and social instability it engenders as well a response to a growing working class consciousness towards revolutionary movement. So we think about uh, what's happening right now our, in our social reality. We're experiencing joblessness, homelessness, poverty, famine, ecocide, global warming, mass incarceration, police brutality, the criminalization of working class people, you and I, the poisoning of our waters and cultural genocide of indigenous land. We, we're experiencing the denial of asylum seekers from natural disaster, political and social unrest, the killing of black and brown bodies, and the attack on historically black colleges and universities. Alongside this over attack on critical race theory, which is representing any ideology that challenges racism, systemic inequities, and white supremacist power structure. So what is our mission? As revolutionaries, we must engage the academy and our communities in revolutionary education that awakens, enlightens, empowers the masses of working class people to unite across all our identities in a movement that will save us all. Our mission is to liberate the oppressed and exploited peoples around the world. There is a question that echoes across generation and we have been charged with answering it. And that question that we ask is here today. How can we take power to create the future? As we grapple with this, we leave you with a quote from the late and great woke revolutionary, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I quote, the struggle for freedom on the part of oppressed people in general and the American Negro in particular is not suddenly going to disappear. It is sociologically true that privileged classes rarely ever give up their privileges without strong resistance. It is also true that once oppressed people rise up against their oppression, there is no stopping point short of full freedom. So realism impels us to admit that the struggle will continue until freedom is a reality for all of the oppressed people of the world. Since the struggle will continue, the basic question which confronts the oppressed people of this world is this, how will the struggle against the forces of injustice be waged? And so we'll jump into our first question. What is the crisis and the opportunity for working class forces to unify politically in the process? And how do we move from the defensive to the offensive in the fight for transformational change? So we're open the uh, floor up for the first question to discuss the first. Yes, sir. I can't see everybody. Somebody want to jump in? I know y'all are burning with that wonderful um this Ethan professor. <laughs> Eophoma is in. Okay. Um Ephoma, you go ahead, you open it up. Hi, hello everybody. I just wanted to jump in real quick. I wanted to say we change, we move from defensive to offensive by we always remember our past, but we don't let it hold us down. So instead of feeling sorry for ourselves, we need to collectively have a subliminal goal for us to reach and an action plan for us to get there. 
Absolutely. And that way we can change. I like that action plan. So that sounds like strategy to me. So anyone wants to, you know, I raise hand button. Okay, I see raise hands. Um, I see Jordan. Hey, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. So my name is Jordan Jones. I'm a senior sociology major and I go to Bowie State University. And to answer the question on how do we move from the defensive to the offensive side in the fight for trans transformational change, first, we do got to look at the past and see where did peace get us? And honestly, from my perspective, I feel like we've tried peace according to my research with Martin Luther King and all the other revolutionaries, for instance, going on march walks across the bridge. So for me, I feel like we got to take more of a chaotic approach. So how we could do it is if we look at the educational system, who is the rest of the collective that we can count on? And that is always a youth. So for us to make any type of transformational change, I will first say, let's attack the educational systems first and change the curriculum. And as Dr. Jackson is, I, hello? Yes. We can hear you. Okay, did we lose them? Okay, we'll come back to you, Jordan. Um, Ethan. Uh, hello, uh, Ethan, uh, pronouns he, him, ours. Um, the, uh, I'm a, I work in the uh, entertainment industry in Los Angeles and uh, as moving to offense, we have to, I agree wholeheartedly with Jordan. I think the key pivotal point is education and stopping the lies. Like if we, we can work on discussing a narrative where people have the facts, we gain a great foothold because we stand upon a moral high ground in the narrative also one of the things that may in this turbulent time move us to a very hard offense is the collapse of the environment. The capitalist structure is leading us literally into unprecedented mass, at, le at the very least, mass human migration. The continent of Africa is planned to not be inhabitable by human beings. This came out last week. In the NASA scientists that work on environmental uh, study have now realized that they have been grossly, is their word, underestimating the impact of greenhouse gases, especially due to the methane release from all the ice melting. So these tipping points have been passed. So where the fact we meet a population loss of up to 80% is not in fa fathomable. That's insane because we need 65% of us to maintain our infrastructure. After that, our infrastructure itself, food, water, uh, transportation, everything begins to collapse. The only way to maintain a civil society in any form is through socialism, through a Marxist idea of communal living, or well, it goes back to Aristotle. But, but these, these, this horrible factor may be one that forces us into the offense. Um, it may not be the traditional armed struggle, as previously written about and intellectualized. But for now, uh, Jordan's talking about non-peaceful and uh, uh, instigation of taking the, the acts towards the state or towards the oppressors. Um, it may very much be necessity. 
So but there's things on the horizon, either traditional and now new with the environmental change that may force us into an offensive position. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you. Um, Zariah. Hi, how are you? Hey. Um, my name is Zara. I apologize, actually. I'm heading home from my son's game. Um, but I personally believe that an offensive approach is to actually look at like collective unity and build a community. Um, when you build the communities where you provide the you're creating an idea of safety and you're creating the idea that it is possible to live without the state. A lot of times people don't really feel like it's possible because they haven't had the opportunity to feel um, connected to their community and with in a way that they feel that they all can be connected and that they all can be safe. So I feel like once we implement that, then people can actually conceptualize the fact that a stateless, um, a stateless place is possible, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, Brandon. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, so my name is Brandon Dent. I'm a junior here at Bowie State, and I'm also a sociology major. And to answer the question at hand, I want to um, sort of quote the pedagogy of the oppressed by Karl Marx. Um, it says, in order for the oppressed to be able to wage the struggle for their liberation, they must perceive the reality of oppression not as a closed world from which there is no exit, but as a limiting situation which they can transform. And so what that means, and rather I want to just put it into terms relative to the question, I feel like um, in order for us to even at least initially understand where we are, we must reflect on why and how the system of capitalism is actually oppressing those who is aimed to oppress particularly people of color or people on a lower socioeconomic ladder. And basically reflection is basically us coming together and saying, okay, we have to understand that this is why it's not, this is why this is not benefiting us anymore. And um, it's also something in a book that my professor gave to me, um, it's into, the cap into capitalism talks about how productivity productivity of labor is actually um, is exceeding the proportion to which that we're actually workers are actually being becoming obsolete due to um, advancement in technology. And so if we bring that back to this quote, I feel like that we're so content with the system we're in and that people who I guess can partially benefit from it, they're okay with that. However, along down the line, this will not be the case for long as if something left festering becomes, how you say, unhinged in a way that hasn't been checked in the past. It can be so detrimental to that, to where that the people who, the oppressed particularly, particularly who put the system in order, it only becomes even worse for those who are trying to even make it in the system at all. So I feel like in order for us to go through on the attack per se, it's just for us to first understand why this system is detrimental to our um, to our well being. Okay, thank you. So next, Jerome. Good morning. Uh, good morning or good afternoon now. <laughs> I hope everybody is doing fine out there. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the first part of the first question. And that is the crises. What is the crises that we're in? Um, as many people have spoken to, we are experiencing many, many crises, you know, and the environment is one of the biggest ones. But, but the thing that, that has been talked about but not emphasized as a crisis and a thing that's making the crises even more intense is this whole transition that we're going through, you know, from, from an industrial-based productive society to a digital-based productive society. Now, there's two things that makes that really important. The first one is that when you have a societal change like that, you know, like the last time this world has witnessed anything like that was the transformation from an agricultural-based 
based economy to an industrial based economy. What happened then is that every, you know, that, that's when all the kings were overthrown and the whole system that held up and, and was built on the basis of agriculture got totally destroyed and gotten rid of. That's the possibilities that we face today in this transition. Our, our ability to be a part of a revolutionary process that's successful is more possible today because of the transition that we're going through. Because capitalism can't do anything about that transition. I mean, they're trying, but, but it's the system itself that is making this transition happen. And they can't do much about the system that they in fact created. You know, and so that's the first thing that this moment is a very, very critical moment. The other thing about the transition is that it intensifies everything. You know, you look at the environment and you and you wonder why is it that we won't do something about it? Because the exploration of the environment is also part of the capitalist trying to save itself. You know, trying to expand its its profit, trying to expand its ability to control to the point where they can kind of hold back this transition as much as possible. So it, in the final analysis, it ends up intensifying the crises that we're already going through. And, and I think this, this moment, a lot of people have emphasized this, and I can't emphasize it even more, is, is the role that education can and should play. This revolution, we talk a lot about the practical aspects of the revolution, the need to go on the offensive. Well, if we don't understand the transition, if we don't understand the crises that capitalism is going through and the power relationships that exist, and the fact that this transition is creating a struggle within the ruling class itself, if we don't understand all those things, it's impossible for us to then make a strategy for going on the offensive. You know, so education, that's the only way we can understand this world to the extent that we can create the necessary strategy to change it fast. Thank you, thank you. All right, I'm hearing some some threads through a lot of the comments that we that we're talking. Um, uh, and forgive me if I mess up anybody's name. Okay, Aaliyah. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning or afternoon. Yes. Um. So I just have a short uh excerpt to read. Um. But basically to expand on the the first part of the question um so class consciousness the awareness of an of individuals in a particular social class that they share common interests and common social situation class consciousness is associated with the development of a class for itself where individuals within the class unite to pursue their shared interests so it seems like everybody's general idea here in my opinion is unity so whether through education or through action, chaos or peaceful means, the ultimate goal is to have a plan and then execute in order to elicit any type of change. So the world, as, as the gentleman was saying before I started speaking, the world is different now than it's ever been. And I think that, you know, in order for us to do anything, we have to have a plan and then execute. Yes. So your strategy informs your tactics right? It's all about having a plan and understanding what that plan has to be, but also that the, the, the rulers, they also have a strategy, right? And recognizing what that is. I see Samantha. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Samantha Pace. I'm a junior at um, Bowie High School. So I just, just to piggyback a little bit on what a couple of people have said um, in terms of Jordan and his radical, their radical approach, as well as Mr. Jerome and him basically saying to, you have to understand the defense in order to be able to come up with a plan for the offense. I do agree. Um, in terms of the radical uh, uh, notion of trying to do something radical, I kind of agree, but I kind of disagree. Um, my my logic more so aligns with uh, like Booker T. Washington, like Booker T. Washington's uh, a statement. What he would he he made a statement that basically said that education is key. However, it won't lead to equality or self-acceptance. So 
his strategy was for us to become more self-sufficient so not to have to depend on a system that wasn't built for us anyway so i feel like that if we took a, a newer approach to that and becoming more self-sufficient, it would solve a lot of issues. There are many crises, uh, mass, mass incarceration, the war on drugs, uh, poverty, uh, the need for labor. And I feel like, yes, we do need to be educated for sure. But then what we do with that education is that we acquire skills in order for us to be able to be self-sufficient. That way we can create our own need for our own labor, in my opinion. So, you know, I just feel like because the system wasn't built for us, we need to build a system that is built for us by us, you know, and that would help us to be able to. Yeah, it's funny because you know, Fubu, but uh, it's built, Come on, built for us. us. <laughs> that's by us, like Fubu, okay? That's how I feel about it. And so I feel like, yeah, education is key for sure. But what we do with it is how we make our plan to to move forward for the generations that are that precede us. And you know, that's just my opinion. Very good. Um, we're getting a lot of good comments too in chat. Um, and one from, from Toby, I don't know if you want to, you know, say a little something in regards to that. I can, I was just, uh, talking about how, um, all of our issues, whether it's racism, classism, all that stuff sort of has like one root that pretty much stems from capitalism and how people try to uphold these systems. And it like, I don't know, it sort of branches out into different forms of oppression so that no, everybody is sort of focused on their own type of oppression that they don't realize that it all comes back to one thing. And so basically we have to like attack it at the root and make sure that we can dismantle the system. Very good. Um, I can I just jump in for a second uh -huh. and sure. say, uh, I, I think that that was very important to lift uh, Tobe. I think that's like very central to what we are trying to figure out. So as we're grappling with this first question and you know we're asking what is the crisis, right? Like that is central to our understanding of the crisis because you're right, right? Like it's multiple forms of, of, of oppression that coalesce right to 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 uphold the system of capitalism and i think you being able to tease that out and i think everybody's generally talking about that right um in so many words but i definitely wanted to uplift um how important it is to attack the the issue at its source right and you did a great job with uplifting that pass very good so i have jalen on stack and then yolanda yeah, so as far as, as how we get control, like go from defense to offense, like people were saying, I think we start, you know, need to start doing more protests. And I think protests need to last for like longer. I feel like protests, on, protests only be lasted for like a week and no changes are made. I think we need to start doing balanced protests instead of changes are like made. Whether that's protests for a month straight, two months straight, I think we need to start like doing more violent protests instead of changes are literally made. That's one thing. That's when I also feel like, um, more black people need to try to get into the police industry or people like um like the, the court industry like who controls how long people are in jail like white black people get less jail time than black people so maybe we need to try to like overpopulate them in those industries and if that don't work if, if, like, if they realize like oh black people are on they're like trying to take over so we're gonna like we're gonna reject them they're not getting a job yeah maybe we need, maybe we need to create we create our, our own system and not try to overpopulate the current white system. All right, thank you. Um, I have Yolanda, and then next will be Genesis. My name is Yolanda, and I think one of the things from going to the defense to the offensive and the crisis is the inevitable breakdown of capitalism. That's inevitable. It's going to happen. Just like in depressions we had before, we're gonna have another depression. Inflation is a catalyst to that. I don't know what inflation is, but I wanted to add that, um, to go and tell the friends that we got understand what we're going through. And that's that I've been, uh, I have, I've been hearing on the news about how this guy, Senator from Alabama, uh, he's, uh, he's saying that 
the, those that are the criminals want to abolish them, want to abolish this, us, he said. So it's clear to me that whatever the left, whether it's the league or all this other group, whatever we engage in, the capitalists, they know what we're talking about and uh, or what we're discussing. And, and, and they're coming out with the against critical race theory with this latest thing of, of um, the abolitionists that why should people help the criminals because that's what they're saying about the criminals that are supporting abolition. And, and it goes back to the history when abolition was used and it's used it as a negative term. I have a lot of friends that are um, socialists, they're Trotskyites. And some of them are uh, starting, uh, uh, engaged in uh, forming a, a party, a communist or a socialist, a Trotsky party. I've been reading the history of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union for the last three, four months in Spanish. When they had a communist party, they, 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 they established a communist party outside of Russia. They established it, they went to Switzerland, I forget where else. Uh, when they when they were finally organizing and um, having um, marches, just for being march, just for marching unarmed, the czars reacted by killing a thousand of them. Uh, according to the book, the, those that that started the the Bolshevik Communist Party were arrested. They were arrested, deported, and they were killed. So my question is, given that type of oppression, I can see why people gravitate towards nonviolence. But my 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 question is this: uh, How can we connect all these movements? There's a lot of division. There, there's a lot of division in this country, and, and I see it all the time. You know, like with DACA, they, they're already saying those that that are here with DACA already can can keep DACA, but no new ones can. No new no new applicants for DACA. That's a different action program for immigrants that came here as children with a paper for their parents. And and those that don't are not in DACA, they cannot apply. It's been taken to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is 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 turning a right wing. You know Thank you. they're Thank gonna you so, so okay. So oh, well, I'm just right. saying but you, you pose a, an important, but I, you pose an important question. How do we unite these scattered movements, right? That is an important question. Uh, Genesis, you go ahead. Hello, I'm Genesis Ramirez. I'm currently a freshman at Bowie State University. Um, I just wanted to piggyback off of what Samantha said before. I think we could be educated to forever, but in a system where we are oppressed, it's only gonna get us so far, where we have to start becoming more self-sufficient while learning more trades to benefit ourselves that are gonna get us farther in different fields, different things in life. So yeah, it was just a little short. Thank you. Um, Crystal. Hi, um, I'm also a freshman um, at Bowie State University. My name is Crystal. And I would just like to add on like, I feel like, um, like as Samantha said, like, yeah, we can be educated, but it means nothing when our education to the system means nothing. So I feel like taking action in your own hands, as um, the young man before said, um, protesting. I think protesting is a really good way of gathering action and gathering people together, as well as into the system and taking over and just being that change that you want to happen. So, yeah. Very good. In terms of the, and this is just a comment from the chat, you know, the question that Rolanda, uh, Yolanda raised about unity, that question of unity. As far as the scattered movements, I believe everyone must find common ground to unite within by noticing we are all experiencing some form of oppression. And that's from um, Ms. Cameron. Uh, Marilyn, you're next. I think you can hear me now. Yes. Um, I, I want to agree with everyone already, but I just wanted to share something that I've been thinking recently that, that helps me as I listen to all of you talk about what's necessary. And that is in the last 10 years, you know, we've been through things like watching the 
the young people of Egypt rise up to, to try to change their system. We're, we're now watching women and the whole country of Iran stand up for we, women, life and freedom. And I think that what it's saying to me is how important what we're saying here today is in the mix of the fact that most of this energy that is going to bring the system down is really out of our control. It's out of the capitalist control, but it's out of the working class's control as well, without building a unified leadership that is based on exactly what we're saying here today. And that is the education to understand our history, to understand how society changes, and to unify those of us who see this need for transformation. So I just want to thank everyone for their comments and say how much I see it all plays into, uh, if, if you're watching on Zoom, you can tell that my hair is very gray, but I was as young as some people here talking today when I first realized that, that we had to take on this struggle. And I can see that we are really getting ready for the moment when the building a firm leadership that understands what's needed for the future is gonna be crucially important. Thank you so much for everything everyone said. Thank you. So, Mr. Jordan, you know, you sparked it off before you left and came back in with your um, comment about a chaotic <laughs> movement. You go ahead with your next comment. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, someone called me and then it automatically disconnected. But just another point to add of, I just want everyone to understand like how powerful we are as beings. And I feel like we deify the system to where we have no voice and we're just their worker and we can't think for ourselves. So I feel like the big issue is, is that we're not understanding how much power we are as a collective if we do mm. come together. For instance, if we all, a hundred of us wanted to walk in a bank right now and ask for the money, what can they do? We outpower them. We can outpower the police. We can outpower any type of government or any type of entity at all. And the big thing is, is everyone is getting manipulated. And the, the biggest manipulation is the root to all evil. And you know what they say is money. And I just feel like money, it, I mean, you know, money is money. But I feel like people, well, well us as, as a community, we just use it to, to survive. And this is not what we call living. Where some of us are scared to talk to our boss and like say what say how we really want to express ourselves just because we know if we do talk to him, we might get fired. And now we're wondering, all right, so how are we going to pay the bills? So I just want to, you know, how we can definitely make this transition. Let's all not go to work for a day, you know, and then the, the America will really fail. And I firmly believe the only reason why America is considered a thriving country and why it's a melting pot for all other cultures is because there's so much control here in this structure. But people tend to forget with a lot of structure and control, that means it's a lot of manipulation going on, you know? So that's just my take on how, how I debunk the system that we're in in today's world. Thank you. So we're getting ready to go to our second question, um, which many of our you know, thoughts and comments will relate to this. So we're gonna go ahead and, and put it on, on the screen, but, and then I will continue on with Stack as well. So um, if your question is more related to the first, that's okay. But we do wanna, you know, look at the second question too, you know, as we, so that, that's the first one. So we're, I'll go ahead and read it and it'll get on the screen. What is our vision and strategy? What's the revolutionary approach to participation in elections in this moment? How does, how does that guide our day-to-day -day tactics? Now we're talking about strategy and tactics now. Uh, I see Zarai. Hello, hello again. Um, 
this is touching on the previous question as well as going on to the next one. Um, if you can't tell, I'm definitely from a school of thought where resources need to be provided first and foremost. And we are in this capitalist situation where we're constantly struggling for survival because it keeps us from being able to kind of rise up or be able to stand for ourselves. Because if we're constantly working from a place for survival, we don't have anything else. So it makes me think of like Fred Hampton and his Rainbow Coalition and how he mm -hmm. had together people from multiple like different races, even different ideology in different ways, but understood that if we bring all these people together and we use each individual like um, group's resources and, and give them to the community and find ways um, then you can bring people in, then you can bring people in for education. It almost makes me think of like missionaries and how missionaries would go when they would provide for people and, and kind of use it in a way to bring people to Christ, as they would say. So it, it's just one of those situations, I think, where when you reach people where they're at, again, you make a place of safety and then you can talk to them about, you know, what we're doing and how we're moving. And also when you build trust, then people are going to find a way or want to promote you politically, right? Because they trust you. They know you're in the community. They know that you are looking out for them versus other people who use threats. Democrats use threats all the time. If you don't vote for us, then, you know, they're going to get rid of, uh, LGBT rights, but at the end of the day, they give these threats and they don't follow with action. Where if we make a, a political party that doesn't work from threats, but works from a place of providing, and then on top of it shows that we work through action, then people would believe us. Very good. Uh, Melissa. Hello. Yes. Okay, so I go to, my name is Mosa. I go to Bowie State University and I'm a junior. And I just want to pick up, piggyback off the first question. I just want to say that even though education is a smart approach to go through it, but it depends how it's brought about because I know, I believe in some states, they want to start teaching that slavery was a good thing, even though we all know that it's a bad thing. So if it's if we teach something that's misleading it can create a whole nother problem you know and also i think that we can make changes by like going within talking to different people and maybe starting from that it will kind of touch people touch people's hearts so then we could come together as a collective and make a change because i believe uh, as i i think a uh, what Jordan said, he said that like, if we come together as a, you know, a, a big group, we can make a change and obviously they can't do nothing to stop us because like you can't control like hundreds of people. Thank you. Yes, very good. Keep in mind, you know, we, we were able to witness what we've been speaking of today. When you think about George Floyd, and the rebellions around that and how that there was a unity you know that came together of different you know different people different you know ethno backgrounds over this issue of police violence right um i now hopefully i don't mess it up zariel Hi, yes, you did pronounce my name right. Yes, okay. I am a freshman at Bowie State. Uh, make a change is by actually pouring into our community. I mean by adding the rec center back because I know growing up when I had the rec center, I used to go there after school, get work there, and also be able to enjoy life at the same time. So bring that back. Then also, I think we really need to touch on a generational wealth, like how to build that. Because half of the stuff that the white people have, they have how to build generational wealth, but we don't. That's why they have the upper hand on us because we don't have the same knowledge like that. So I feel like if you bring some knowledge up there and put it in our community, we are able to have the knowledge and could go back and forth with them. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna call on a couple of people that haven't had opportunity just yet. Um, 
Alaje. For algae. Yes, thank you. I told y'all. Sometimes I might mess it up. Oh no, it's okay. Uh, my name is Algie Barry. I'm a singer at Boy State. Um, I just wanted to touch on um, the, one of the previous young ladies. She said something about uh, trying to get everyone to unite more and different, you know, and that kind of stuck with me because from what I see, um, we've already done a lot of fighting. We've done a lot of protesting. Um, and I know that doesn't change any, change anything to make it stop. You know, I'm not saying stop the protest. All I'm saying is I think we need to unite in a way of education and understanding and, and more of a to more diversify our, our position. You know, the more people we can get to more come together and to fight together, we'll have better, you know, we'll have better position. And with that position, we'll be able to move forward. You know, one thing I've learned over the last two years, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. And if we can get certain people in certain positions of power and get them to understand our fight, I think it'll push us a lot further than being violent or rowdy or things like that. Because you just don't, if you, if you understand the person who's yelling the most, they can pay no attention to. It's usually the person with the calm approach who can get through to more people who gets, you know, exactly what they're trying to get. And I think if we all come to a collective and understand it's about position and power and education, then we'll move forward a lot in this. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually have something to add as well uh, to that point. Okay. And who are you, my friend? Hi, pleasure to meet you. My name is Justin Godley. Um, I'm a senior at Bowie State University and I'm a marketing major, but I took a sociology class and uh, it very much has fascinated me. So one of the things I think I wanted to add to that point um, was the fact that like uh, when it pertains to like social change and it pertains to making choices, and especially when it pertains to capitalism, um, they don't have the, the problem is, is one of the things I've noticed from a business lens is this thing called techno uh, neo feudalism, which is the uh, it's, it's not necessarily a theory as much as it is a fact, but it's the concept in which uh, big business has um, basically taken control of a lot of the information systems that we use in our day to day, like, you know, cell phones, technology and how that's had like a ripple effect on um, other sociological factors, such as racism, such as oppression. And uh, one of the things that I think I would add to that I idea of, you know, reaching up to people in uh, governmental systems, people with power, is to kind of just um, kind of engage with the idea of also um, limiting the power uh, through social change that other people had mentioned um, by, you know, maybe protesting against some of these big conglomerates that control the um, kind of the technological uh, advancements and um, the information in that sense. Okay, thank you. Um, Raisha, Raisha. I think you mean me and it's Risa. Risa. That's you. okay. I, I answer to lots of different names. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I just wanted to um, address a guiding our day-to-day -day tactics. Um, I'm a senior, not in college uh, by age, and I am doing what I affectionately call uh, social justice retirement. So for the last, since like 2016, I've just been on the ground talking to a lot of people, doing work. Um, but one of the things I notice is a lot of times people feel like they don't know where to step in and how to step in. They say, well, I can't be an activist like you. Like I didn't call myself an activist. I'm just doing what I can. But then I, you don't have to do me, do what you can. So really having conversations with people to help them see where they can fit in. And I really appreciate Community Ready Corps um, talks about the relief arena and how politics and government isn't gonna solve the problem, but we can reduce harm by our participation. So for example, in the current election, Oakland has a measure, I think it's W, about democracy dollars. It's not gonna solve everything, but it will give more people a little bit of a voice and who gets elected, um, getting ranked choice voting nationwide. Again, until we get money out, 
it won't solve everything, but it will be a step to help us to get more people like Carol Fife, who's a radical black woman in Oakland sitting on city council. So, you know, encouraging people to really have conversations with the people in your life, because the people with whom we have relationships are the people who we can influence to help us be part of the solution. So, and one thing for this radical group, for years I've been asking people, what's the industry we can support to go on strike that's not gonna hurt most of us, but will hurt you know, the, the super wealthy? And then they go on strike and the rest of us support them while they're on strike. So all you radical thinkers, who is that? What group is that? we can encourage to go on strike while the rest of us support them and hurt the oligarchy. Thank you all for your time. That's an interesting question. First thing that came to my mind was fast food workers. Crystal. I, I just wanted to go back and um, like answer the second question, the first part. Um, I think that the um, vision is to like, um, unify people and bring them together to create change. And I think a good way of doing that is like, like for example, when um, Zariel referred to um, her recreational center, um, informing people like how they can change their community in their way, like in things they care about, like in their community. Like for example, for me, I know a big change is like cleaning up the streets. So if you're able to come to me and convince me to, um, go ahead with change and that it would clean up my streets, I would be in for it. So I just think like going to people and hitting them like where they want change. Very good. Miss Kim. Hi, me? Yes, you. Hi. <laughs> Hi everyone. Thank you for calling on me. I just, uh, thanks. I'm really enjoying this discussion and everything. I wanted to just uh, kind of pull a couple of things together that I heard. Uh, thank you all for putting on this great event. Um, I'm also a member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, and I'm a psychology instructor, um, but I'm a revolutionary first and foremost and a, a, a person of the people, so I'm so happy to be with you. I noticed that Jordan was emphasizing the need for people to really come together and take action, to take what we need, basically. Um, and I think that is that is what that is the overall process that is underway, or that must be underway, is us coming together, uniting to get what we need. Um, it relates to so how are we going to do that? Why would we do that? Um, we have to get political power in order to create the society that takes advantage of the abundance that Anthony mentioned, that Professor Jackson mentioned, there is abundance. It's a lie that there's scarcity. It's a lie that there's not enough. It's a lie that we need to fight against each other to survive. Yes, that is part of the capitalist system, but that's not the way that it has to be. And so, um, so then we have to help more people see that. And that's the type of a of education that we're talking about. That's the type of education that Jerome is talking about. He's not talking about mainstream education. Although if you're lucky enough to have a professor like Professor Jackson or uh, Professor Walda or uh, myself or others, you're gonna get a different type of education. But for the most part, you're gonna get, uh, you're not gonna get the type of education that we're doing here. That's what we mean by education. We're not talking about the same education. We create working class education. We create uh, education of, that helps you understand racial capitalism and what we're gonna do to get through it. And then the, the last thing is, uh, and, uh, Anthony talked about the revolution that's going on that's, uh, and Jerome as well, that it's changing everything. Just like the industrial revolution was a whole new society. The technological revolution is a whole new thing. It's creating a new group of people that can't work anymore. They're becoming this social force that Anthony, uh, I'm sorry, that Jordan is talking about that we can come together. But that social force that's being thrown out of the economy has to get that education that we're talking about. And then we have to come together and be able to be like, okay, 
what do we want? What do we need? How are we going to figure that out? And so, and that's what this meeting is part of. So I'm really excited to be a part of that, you know, combining the education with thinking about the strategy and tactics to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kim. All right. Um, I see Samantha. Okay, Samantha. Yes. Samantha yeah. again. All right. Yeah. So in, in terms of the vision and the strategy piece of it, um, I really, really love Ms. King's answer because I was actually about to say something very similar. Like, but to put it in layman's term, I feel like we need to pull the rug from under their feet. And, and what I mean by that is, is the system as a whole there needs to be some type of independent unity. And what I mean by that is like by, by I mean, I'm sorry, independent unity. And what I mean by that is like by community, community by working with the people in our community. And I get that, you know, that's been said too, but we need like people like us and not even necessarily just black people, but people who have the same mindset and power because of the simple fact that that's when we'll be able to actually make change. And when I was talking about self-sufficiency, I don't mean necessarily having to build a system up from the ground up. We could also infiltrate a system that's already in place and make change. And so I feel like that's when it would actually, um, you know, make some type of change. Like, and I think that in terms of education, like I was saying, like like Jordan was saying, like Ms. King just said, education is absolutely important. I feel like people need to, I feel like our people have forgotten the history of when we didn't have rights to vote of when we didn't have uh, uh, the ability to uh, walk into and, and put our ballot in. And so because they have forgotten those things, they don't realize how precious it is to actually go out and be able to make change with just your voice, just just a ballot, you know what I'm saying? So I feel like people need to also be um, more educated in, in reference to that, in reference to their history, why we have gotten to where we are, how we got to where we are. And then we need to raise people up from our community, community by community. We need to raise people up that already have knowledge or, or raise them up with the knowledge so that they can actually grow up and get in Congress and, and we have a second black president or, or even a, a revolutionary uh, a, a president that doesn't they don't even have to be black but the fact of the matter is that someone who actually understands what our plight is and actually is going to get in and actually enforce real change so you know yeah very good very good hi um can I jump in You're Nayara no this is mahogany hi mahogany can I, can I put you on stack? You know, there's not too many ahead of you. Can I put you on stack? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Nara? Hi, my name is Nayara Thomas. I'm a sophomore at Bowie State, and I also attend Professor Jackson's sociology class. And I feel like our vision is united. United, yeah. And I'm a quote from my third with clean that we must all learn to live together as brothers, or we will perish together as fools. So in order for there to be change, we must use our voices to gain power against capitalists. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mahogany, go on, girl. Okay, so um, Samantha had a really great point and she literally like took the words out of my mouth. I've been raising my hand up and down this whole time trying to figure out how to just like word it together. But she uh, she hit like the strategical part of it for me. So she said that we don't need to build it from the ground up. And I also noticed that she mentioned Booker T. Washington previously. So if you have any type of background knowledge on Booker T. Washington, he basically took back what they took from us. So he appealed to the white like the white communities, the white founders, the white capitalists, and he got them to invest into black business so, so they could be able to like self-sustain each other. So therefore, like when she said not to build from the ground up, and I see a lot of um, people saying like educational purposes uh, need to beat this capitalism and like protesting and everything, but I never saw nobody saying to take back what they took from us. So I feel like if we are like Booker T. Washington and are able to finesse them, how they finesse us and, and plant it within our own like businesses, educational um, facilities and everything. I feel like that would help us a lot. So basically, like, and that was a lot of controversial when it came to Booker T. Washington because he, or he, he initially proposed something that they were already exploiting and people was taking it as if he was giving them more, but he was actually appealing so he could get what he wanted. So I just wanted to like bring that to like, because she's like, when she said, we don't need to build it from the ground up, like that was, that really stuck with me because we don't, we just have to take back what's taken from us. And if we have to finesse, appeal, whatever means we have to do, I feel like 
we could just get it done that way. So I just want to bring like Booker T. Washington into it. And like, again, great points, Samantha, like you really hit it for me. Um, I have a question more than like a statement. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, when it comes to the current political system, um, does, does anyone believe that infiltrating the system, or it seems like a couple believe that infiltrating the system will actually work to our benefit um, if the system has so many roadblocks? Like how would we go about um, creating a party that could actually produce change within the current system? That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. I got some veterans on stack. So let me start with Steve. Thank you, everybody. This is a wonderful discussion. Um, if we look at Jackson, Mississippi, and the horror that was perpetuated there and still is perpetuated, we see that they say, oh, we could only fix this for a billion dollars. That's all, but there's just no money. The Pentagon spends $2 billion a day every day. So there's plenty of money, but that money goes to corporations. This is the hidden thing that is behind virtually every issue that we run, run against uh, in public education, in um, Medicare. The corporations control it, and they control it by saying that we, we are the people in society that should have this power. Um, if you look at housing, just in the last less than 10 years, corporations now control directly most of the housing in the United States. And the prices are going up because they want them to go up. Uh, this shows you we're really up against something that's really serious. We're not going to fix this by reforming it. Uh, I, do, I do think that uh, the last speaker made a good point. Yes, we need to infiltrate it, but we shouldn't infiltrate it and be under the illusion that somehow we can fix it if we're in there. The infiltrating it is part of taking it apart. Um, we're uh, in every situation, you see the role of private property. It's, it's hidden, it's behind the scenes, but it's always active and can always be brought to the fore. It's not an abstraction anymore. It's a real thing because these guys are bent and determined to take away everything that we have, uh, including our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Ethel. Yeah, y'all are throwing down some important knowledge up in here. Happy to be with you. Um, wonderful, wonderful discussion. I, let me go back to a through line, I think with some of um, Professor Jackson and other persons, but a big picture transition we're in. And what does that afford us? And this transition, we're going from one economy to another. And a part of that new economy is um, they don't need us in the paid workforce any longer. I mean, us human beings. So these white nationalists, and Christian nationalists, and all these people who want to like kill up on us. Newsflash, we all have been rendered expendable. And so a part of our vision has to be about the notion that based on the abundance that this phenomenal digital, and I'm hearing, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get the names wrong, but you know, about building on what's there, the abundance is what our foremothers, forefathers, oldies like me and some others here helped to generate for humanity at this stage. And it absolutely is to be applied going forward. So the notion of um, our vision that the abundance needs to be applied to assisting the planet and humanity. Secondly, I think this idea that because we have production on a different basis, i.e. digital technology does it, I'm going to be so happy when I don't have to be an old caregiver taking care of other broken down sick people and having robots do it. But you know what that's going to require? Distribution based on need not based on if you got money in your pocket. So a part of our vision has got to be, we, this through line is about distribution on a different basis. And humanity's there all throughout the world. Our brothers and sisters who don't have but a dollar a day to distribute. The only way they're gonna get clean water and have access is if we can have distribution 
on a different basis if they're in parts of the, of the world where they're being climatized, where they can't even live there lo any longer. Third part, strategy. This question of strategy, um, you know, there's only a few of these thugs that are running, running up everything up in this world. And what we don't have is a unified plan. And I hear people speaking to, so let's elevate the point of uniting uh, those of us who are this precariat, those of us who can only uh, exist by um, marching from one part of this continent to the other to try and get safety and economic security. But that needs to be a political part of our plan. And I think that's what people were speaking to about the need for political education to help elevate that we have power. One thing I love about your generation is your sense of agency. And fourth thing, and I'll shut up, I promise. Um, I was so happy that there was another person that was here from others that are here from Oakland. And besides those dollars, I, I hope people from Oakland are aware, we got some dynamite stuff on our local ballot. And this is an example of why we have to be involved for all the reasons that people were saying. So our that firebrand, Revolutionary Carol Fife has pushed our city council to put for the first time in the uh, many decades I've lived here to develop um, extremely low uh, income house to build 13,000 units of extremely low income housing on the ballot to change our bonds so that it would then be paid for to ensure that not only uh, that, but also that uh, renters um, as well as people in RVs have eviction protection. That's because we had a movement that put that as front and center. So those are the battle for the immediate needs while we strive for those bigger vision and strategy. But those are concrete things. If you live in Oakland, trust me, the real estate people are not gonna want to see those things pass. We have to educate our public and make sure they're passed. But those are big things that are on this ballot. And I think those are the ways that they uh, intersect and come together. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Ethel. All right, so I have, um, I know I saw your hand up and down, Raya, what you got to say? There? Okay. How about Gloria and or Sal? Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit of the experience, you know, that uh, that I've had, and uh, I'm one of those uh, social justice retired people. But <laughs> I I want to I want to um, speak about some um, aspects of dealing with uh, political or candidates and that type of thing that I've had to deal with some hypocrisy, and that I really uh, I prefer honesty. Uh, I don't want to uh, support someone that is selling part of the people down the, down the river. Um, like, like we see that all the time, some of the tactics of those you know, that are ruling this uh, country is what they do is split us in one way or other. Uh, they've, they've had a lot of practice and um, trying to divide us by who was born here, who wasn't born here, um, if you're a DACA, you know, that, that split you away from your family members, you know, for having amnesty for all. We have people in this country that have lived here 20 to 30 years, pay taxes, but do not vote because they're not allowed, um, you know, an adjustment to their status. Uh, I do want to say that, um, that, uh, that many times we find ourselves uh, to have to decide between uh, voting for the least of the of the two evils, and I don't like that. But you know, I'm not real sure. Um, I know young people that are, that are on this uh, Zoom will probably have to consider, you know, what they're willing to um, uh, accept or not accept when they're uh, working on this. I recently had uh, an issue with one of our senators, and so she has a lot of support from the Mexican community, but he she sold. Uh, people down the river by not accepting that prisoners who've completed their sentence already are still given to ICE, to immigration, even though they've completed their sentencing. Anyways, it's an unfairness. And I was just really appalled by how she, what's, she did not support that that should end. 
But anyways, I, I, there's more, there's a deeper uh, angle to understanding the issues. Just ask a lot of questions. That's what I would say. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Tobe. Hi, I uh, wrote something in the comments talking about how when people were bringing up um, education as a strategy, I thought that we should also use education as a strategy, but also make it simplistic because there aren't a lot of people who have the tools to attend college. So there are certain vocabulary that is used that might not uh, connect well with the general public. So if we simplify our message or whatever we wanna get across, we will be able to garner more support. Um, and what really made me think about that was during 2020, there was like a rise of like political debates on like TikTok through live videos. And what I realized is that even though a person might've been talking about something that is within everybody's best interest, people weren't really listening because they were using language that wasn't really just simple enough to, for people to digest. And um, the other side, even though they might not have been talking with people's best interests at heart, um, they were still using simple language, simple concepts. They appealed to the way people learned, maybe like visual, like a meme or something, um, and just appeal to different uh, demographics, age groups and stuff like that. So I feel like we, it is important to know that vocabulary because we wanna understand what the ruling class means when they say certain things. But in order to understand what they mean, you have to have like a simple concept first. Okay, thank you. Um, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. Are you muted? Sorry, I'm muted. I should know these things. I'm part of tech. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, I did put this in chat and I'm listening to what everybody's saying and especially about um, the offense part. And um, I had I had said pretty much, if you're going to take down a system, you have to first know how you are going to replace the institutions that people seriously need. Um, if you just take down a system, a government or anything, it creates a power vacuum where people who want to take power will uh, manipulate the system to do the same exact thing with nepotism and corruption. So when we talk about institutions and, and I'm gonna, you know, we're talking about like hospitals, how are people like that are vulnerable that need um, healthcare and prescriptions going to get all of that? Um, how are we going to implement school? Um, if we are going to also do political education, how far is it gonna go into educating even young people so that they do understand what we're saying? Um, how are you going to deal with banks and the financial aspects? How are people going to get their food? All of these things are tied to our government um, and also how we are going to defend ourselves, because if we did somehow dismantle the government, then we're pretty much being left open and vulnerable to the world. So I think that um, when we talk about how we're going to be offensive and also thinking of uh, a strategy, that is a massive project, but it isn't something that can't be done because there are many instances in history where people have been able to create a revolution where they were able to take the government down. The issue became the fighting over how the institutions were, were laid out. So if you have a consensus of how these institutions will be laid out, I believe that you would have a much better success in doing something for all people. Thank you. All right, um, going down stack, Miss Rita. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Hey, Anthony. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you. I'm uh, Rita in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Michelle just sort of hit a lot of what I was wanted to say, so I'll be brief. I think that's that's very powerful. 
when we're talking about vision and when we're talking about vision as it relates to electoral politics, say, for example, or the question of somebody asked it earlier, I, I don't know who it was, but basically asked the question, are we talking about reforming a system of making a system try to do what it ought to do for us? Or are we talking about revolution, a new system, a different way of being? And I think that, you know, in the day to day battles, we have to engage wherever we are in what we're doing, as everybody has said, from the bottom up, from the ground up, get those communities together. It's also true that I think strategically we need to start having conversations about what is our shared vision, what is really possible, not only possible, but also necessary at this point. For example, um, Michelle just mentioned healthcare, right? Um, many of us have been involved for many years for the fight for Medicare for all, single payer, national health insurance, all of these kinds of things. But that is, uh, and that's fine, and we have to engage in that. But the vision is limited about what the possibilities of actually creating a healing process, a healthy society, a non-toxic society, where we see the relationships between climate crisis, health care, policing, all of the issues that are facing us and begin to flip it on its head. What kind of world do we really want to live in? You know, what are we talking about in terms of peace and cooperation and building human relationships that are based on relationships between humanity and not based on laws that protect private property, which is essentially uh, so much of what we've been talking about today. So I am exceedingly optimistic uh, in terms of having real conversations, strategic conversations about what would make what would make human happiness possible? How do we actually heal the earth? What kind of institutions have to be dismantled? And what kind of institutions do we need to be building? Uh, and how does the state interact with that? What is it that we have to do in terms of getting rid of that apparatus, that violent apparatus that oppresses us in so many ways in order to create an apparatus that that embodies humanity and embodies an international and loving community perspective. So uh, I'll stop there. We, we, we need to share conversations about vision. That's, <laughs> okay, that's right, very good. So um, I got Jordan and then David. Go ahead, Jordan. Okay, so just listening to everyone, everyone had great, great points. And all the points just lead back to the mass amount of people that are oblivious to the fact that we're being lied to. So I feel like for our vision to really spread the message is to plant as many seeds as possible. And for us to do that, from my perspective, my plan is I, I, I want to keep diving deeper into sociology. And then I want to make this a mainstream trend. It's easy to have like trends just because people are so manipulated to the media, like we'll call Michael Jordan's shoes value just because of the person. So I, how I feel like I can tackle this is to start off from a macro perspective, like maybe with Bowie State, I, I wanted to talk to Dr. Jackson about this. How can we push this message mainstream just to educate our fellow peoples, like where we come from? And the only way to do it is to collectively come together, same, same way with how, how did they make my, my institution, Bowie State? There's a collective of people to come together, all had the same vision and approach. They held the vision and they made it happen. So that's all I feel like we have to do it. We just have to plant as many seeds as possible. I plan on starting, I work at a middle school and I'm a guidance counselor. So I plan on starting a mentoring group. And with my mentoring group, I'm going to teach them the same lessons that I'm learning in class, but just make it a little, a little bit easier for them to understand. And then from there, I'm going to start to make a nonprofit organization and then you know, whenever I teach them, they're going to plant seeds into other people, just how I learned from Dr. Jackson. It's all about, you know, it's a domino effect. The word just gets around so quick. And I believe for the consciousness to shift, we do have to make this like a mainstream type of thing, just like the NBA basketball and, you know, just like football. And I feel like it's pretty simple to do, but it's just the educational part. You know, more people need to learn about this. 
Yep, and so, that's yeah. what we're trying to do. Very good. Go ahead, Anthony. Oh, me? Yeah. <laughs> You had oh, I didn't even know. I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, no. Uh, I, I, that, that was great, Jordan. I think that this is all important. I, you know, I oftentimes think about when we start talking about rev revolution or revolutionizing something. Um, I mean, I, I think what was coming to mind, and as I was hearing people, was you know, a pen is a pen is a pen. A pencil is a pencil. You know, uh, uh, a a daggone placeholder is a placeholder what we do with it is 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 really important so to Rita's point when we think about the state and we think about how it represents just this coercive arm of the ruling class we think about the police the military the national guard and we think about how how they rule through force and coercion well when we think about reimagining a society where this is no longer less necessary how can we use the the resources that we have already developed right towards giving life instead of taking life away, right? Like everything that we do must be life giving. And so as we're re as we're thinking about, right? Like um, not being in this closed system to bring this point where there is no escape. The system is like this and is open, only gonna exist as this. If we think about it as having a, a, being an open system, well, we truly have the power to create substantive change. Uh, th the questions that we've developed Right, we're around getting at what does it look like for us to not just pontificate about what we could do moving forward, but what can we do politically, uh, uh, practically to move forward towards true revolutionary change? And so I think it was Soria that uplifted this when she started talking about the Rainbow Coalition, right? When she started talking about being politically involved and what that looks like. And I think maybe Steve or someone lifted up th this up when we start thinking about right the democrats or republican right it's either this or it's this that's think about it in a closed system a closed way how can we reimagine um a, a, a strategy to really um infiltrate to disrupt to really reorganize right being engaged in reformative struggles we have to know that that is only a microcosm of a much larger process that needs to happen, right? We are actively engaged in these reformative struggles in our different cities, in LA and DC and so on, right? Knowing that is that is a means by which we're able to create true change, but we have to organize collectively like this, right? And that's why this deeper dive conversation is so important. We are uh, 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 trying to develop this working class collective as an intellectual force towards these revolutionary ends because it's really really important so as jordan and the rest of you are going back to your respective areas know that this is a home to be able to learn how to move in this world and to know that you are not alone because we have to bear one another's burden alone we can't do anything our powers are in the numbers and so um, I, I I just want to echo everyone's sentiment in 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 the need for unity, um, and just appreciate this collective discussion. Patch. Yes, thank you, um, David. Thanks for patiently waiting. Thank you. I'm David. I'm a member of Learn. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and uh, taking off on that idea of we're not alone. We should understand that what we're doing here is being done all over the world that uh, there are liberation struggles all over the world, uh, that the world is struggling for a multipolar world order and not just a world order that's controlled by the United States. So we, and there are countries that, there are certain countries where our class has state power. They've created new educational systems, housing, eradicated poverty. So I think we need to understand we're in that context. We're not all alone in the motherland doing what we're doing. There's a whole world struggle going on, and it's a world struggle to get a hold of these new means of production and use them for the benefit of mankind. And you can see that some, some countries are advancing really quickly because they have this digital production, whereas in the past it would have taken them years and years and years to, to make the accomplishments that they're making. So I think we, we need to keep this in context. You know, 63% of our budget or 53% of our budget goes to war. That's our money being spent to oppress other people. 53% of the, of the municipal budgets go to the police. So they've got a hell of an apparatus with our money trying to control us. 
We need to lift that off, off of, and other people are fighting to get rid of that. We should be part of that worldwide struggle and not forget the brothers and sisters that have suffered under this, this system all over the world, even worse than us. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, Miss Rosemary, and then I have Ethan on stack and we're gonna be wrapping up. Hi, I'm Rosemary from LA. And I've just returned from an international conference by um, educators and community and students. And it's an amazing conversation that everyone and the ideas people are putting out. And here again, these kinds of conversations are going on. Our key thing is, is on education. It's not just within the walls of the academy, but what we call popular education. And our conference was uh, really emphasizing working with community, educating together. And some of the communities, we were up in really tiny remote rural areas of Oaxaca where there's indigenous education. It's a huge fight, teachers get murdered over it. And the whole concept of popular education and working with and as part of the community and building on the sense of communality. And it's going on worldwide. And this kind of education with what we're doing, this kind of talking to people in languages that are accessible, having them teach us, us teach them. But that sense of community is what, we, what we're building. And this kind of education is what we have to do to understand what the fight is. And yes, some of the fight is around education, specifically how fascism is coming into that and undermining it. And meanwhile, worldwide, we're seeing things happen like um, 200 million people in India protesting, women in South Korea and Japan, and in Iraq, we're finding in Iran and here, average age is 15. I mean, you, you guys are, you're it. This is your future and this is how we'll build it together. And people know what kind of future do we have under this system? It's this conversation of how we together are going to build another world. And it's going on um, just before and then during at the beginning of COVID, there were hundreds of uprisings around the world and that's still going on. And this is what we need, these kinds of conversations. And here I am at a com uh, conference last week with people from all over South, um, with people all over the Americas even someone from uh, England and the same kind of conversation in a different form that we have to get beyond just reform because otherwise we're not going to make it. Yes, thank you. thank you, Rosemary. So I have Ethan and then Walter, you're going to be our closer. You're going to be our closer girl. Go ahead, Ethan. Are you muted? You're muted, Ethan. Yeah, just to address um, the concerns on how we might be susceptible later to say military invasion or attack from other fascist organizations if we make actual substantial change in this country, we have to remember that the, one of the biggest revolutions of the last century was the Russian one, which was also helped implemented by primarily the Russian Navy. And that our military technically serves the people. And if we can educate and have a cross the board um, awakening, uh -huh, sorry, um, of the proletariat, that should not be a challenge. And then as for distribution and um, building a society that provides to all, not just the proletariat, because we're, we're entering a new class of people that do not work, that there will be an entire new class of people that are unable to work. So it'll be each according to them as humans to their needs. And that infrastructure already exists and we just have to appropriate it. Amazon is there. You just call it up, say, look, my family's hungry. Mm. It's there to the next day. We have the technology and the infrastructure to already do this. And the threat of external force is not a threat to the United States because we have such a massive military force. And another thing is that as we say we move on the offense, since this is recorded, I would just like to point out first that they 
they they they continually ask and continue to demand that the left stay nonviolent. When you look across the world, you see hundreds of people every day being murder, murdered by corporatists. All the indigenous people in Brazil trying to protect re, uh, rainforest over the last what, three or four years has been thousands. People all over are taking out by death camps. But what I would like people to read is just Marx's ideas on proletarian terror. All right, that's all, thanks. Thank you. Ms. Walder, go ahead and take us home. Well, we are collectively taking ourselves home. Um, so I'm Walda, and I am part of the Deeper Dive Collective and League of Revolutionaries. And, you know, it's been such a rich conversation that I raised my hand and put it down about five times. But I think as we're closing out, I want to go back to um, the first part of the title, which is taking power to create our future and to hold our future. And so we've talked about the importance of revolutionary education, educating ourselves. We've talked about the vision that we have abundance and we have the knowledge and skills to create a world in which we are rehumanized and in which nature is protected. And I think a piece that I want to raise is the question of our revolutionary organization. Anthony just kind of alluded to it, but we have got to build a huge collective. If we are a country of 350 plus million people, then we need a revolutionary organization of of millions of us, you know, five, 10, 15 million people. So I think what I wanted to um, leave us with is uh, we're asking folk not just to be present here, which was fabulous, but how are we gonna stay connected? How are we gonna stay collectivized? What are our next steps in maintaining the richness of the conversation, of the education and of the practical activity that all of us are engaged in. So that to me is one of the key struggles that those of us that are revolutionaries are really grappling with, is how do we build out um, a consistent collective organization that appreciates all of our diversity, but understands that we have common interests as well as a common enemy, okay? and that this is going to be an ongoing process. So that's by way of invitation for you all to you know, fill out the eval, to share your, your contact info and to say, we are gonna continue not only this conversation in education, but we are gonna continue to work together concretely on the ground day to day, but with this vision of of a world of plenty and abundance for all of us. Um, some of us call it socialism, some of us call it communism, but it is meeting basic human needs and protecting the earth, air, water um, that we all live in. So um, join us. And um, I'm sure Kim and Anthony might want to say something else to close out. But this has been incredible to everybody who joined and to the whole Red, Deeper Dive, Rev Ed, Rev Tech team. You all, we have been awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walder. Yes. So that is, again, extending the invitation to, to keep one this going, to increase our numbers of revolutionaries that are building a, a nationwide and a worldwide collective because that's what we need. That strength in numbers is what we need. So we encourage you the, um, the link to the evaluation, which makes these type of events better. Your input is in the chat. So please take a moment. Um, the ways that you can connect to us has also um, been placed in chat. And we hope that you consider making the league a revolutionary is your political home because we're here and we're trying to be here for all for one and one for all. There will be another uh, dialogue for revolutionaries next weekend on the 22nd. It's Saturday. It'll be 11 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern, and it's building the progressive tidal wave in the 2022 elections. 
So those, um, that question that Zarai did uh, pose about how do you infiltrate the system and how do we create a party that works for us? That's, that would be a critical question for, for this dialogue happening next weekend. So you go to our website, which is posted on the screen there, the League of Revolutionaries, dot org and stay connected with us with that anthony if you have anything to add go ahead yeah no i think y'all did it you we went and did the benediction the altar call and everything so <laughs> i think it was pretty good i just i what came to mind initially is just the 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 quote from paulo freire that talks about um it's only when the oppressed find the oppressors out and become involved in the organized struggle for their liberation, that they begin to believe in themselves. This discovery cannot be purely intellectual, but must involve activism, nor can it be limited to mere um, activism, but must include serious reflection. Only then will it be a practice. And so um, we encourage y'all to come um, get involved uh, so that we can really fight together in this struggle towards true um, transformative change and liberation for all our people. All right. I'll see Wonderful, y'all everyone. Thank you. Uh-oh. <clears throat>